Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the latest edition of the East New England Chapter Vertical Flight Society uh, webinar, Lunch and Learn webinar. Uh, this will be our last webinar for the fiscal year, so we take a few months off in the summertime, and uh, as everybody goes on vacation and, and it's just it's tougher to uh, get speakers, it's also tougher to get a lot of participation. But so we'll uh, we'll take a couple months off, start back up in September. And so when we start up in September, I'm happy to report that uh, we'll do a mixture of uh, lunchtime webinars as well as dinner meetings. So depending on on the speakers and the availability to be physically here, uh, we'll decide uh, whether or not we uh, we do a dinner meeting or uh, continue with a lunchtime type webinar. So so we've learned that this this venue and this uh, this media. Uh, is very effective tool for communicating and getting a lot of participation. So, uh, so we'll continue with the webinars uh, as appropriate, and uh, and we look forward to doing that uh, in the fall, both a mixture of dinner meetings and, and webinars. Uh, you know, I, I always give my uh, plug for uh, consider to join the Vertical Flight Society. You know, I participated recently in the board of directors meeting of the Vertical Flight Society, and uh, and. You know the last uh, forum, forum uh, I think it was 76 that we had. Uh, there was just a great attendance. It was done virtually, and we, we still had uh, well over a thousand people attending. Uh, and membership has been increasing dramatically in the Vertical Flight Society. So, so you know it's it's really a historic time in our industry. And so we should all, you know, all of us that are enthusiasts in this industry should be sort of reveling in that. Uh, you know, between the the U.S. Army and the Future Vertical Lift Program, which is which is driving a lot of innovation and and uh, and prototyping into into rotorcraft, to the urban air mobility, which is driving also just a ton of innovation in a little bit different market segment uh, into into vertical flight, is just uh, unprecedented, really. Uh, so it's a very very exciting time to be part of the vertical flight industry and encourage those of you who are not members to uh, to consider joining. It's uh, it's a great society. You know, there's great benefits to it. Uh, first, you get uh, access to VertiFlight magazine, which uh, which is just a terrific magazine. Uh, I think it comes out every other month. Uh, it's got a great summary of all the happenings in our industry and uh, very well written, terrific authors, great features. Uh, both in terms of programs as well as people, so it's uh, it's a very well done magazine. Uh, Vertical Flight Society also has a number of webinars uh, in uh, different aspects of vertical flight. Uh, once we all get back to able to get back together again, uh, we'll we'll it's a great opportunity to network, you know, in person. And then lastly, uh, networking also in the annual forum, uh, which uh, which typically happens in uh, in May. Of each year, and uh, so so this past May we had the Forum 77, not 76, uh, and uh, and we look forward to Forum 78 uh, next year. Okay, so behind the scenes in this webinar we have Lauren Wolf and Scott Hanula, and so Lauren's kind of pulling all the strings on the uh, on the presentation and the video, and Scott is going to consolidate and read the questions for us to our guest speaker. So, uh, so if you have a question, please use the chat function or the, or the uh, I'm sorry, the, the question function, and uh, and Scott will consolidate it. And after after Herman's presentation, uh, he will uh, he'll read the questions for us. And so with that, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. And so we're very very lucky to have uh, a great representative for for the urban air mobility market segment that I spoke of earlier in my opening. And so. Uh, Herman Wegman is is from Beta Technologies, and uh, he's been with Beta for four years. Uh, prior to that, yeah, he's he's their uh, uh, essentially their chief technology officer. Prior to that, you know, he worked at GE Global Research for 17 years in various capacities uh, of electric power. So so Herman is an industry expert in electrical power. He's got a bachelor of science in electrical engineering from Worcester Polytech and a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Wisconsin. And so allow me to introduce to you Herman Wegman, who's going to explain to us uh, what is going on at Beta Technologies. Herman? 
Harry, thanks so much for the introduction. And it is exciting for me to present now to the Vertical Flight Society. Um, it's a great time in the history of flight. And Beta as a company is really focused on revolutionizing flight through electrification. So thank you for the introduction. I hope you all find this uh, webinar uh, informative, exciting, and hopefully a little bit humorous. Uh, how do I change slides? Thanks. EVAs or EV tall aircraft. Uh, I think EVAs might stick. We'll see if the industry adopts that. But uh, it's electrification of vertical aircraft. And the, really the draw for this is CO2 emissions. Um, energy costs are much less uh, for the electric side than it is for fuel side. So reduced operating cost and hopefully much lower maintenance. Uh, but there's also flexibility. Uh, this ability to get a uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft out of the deal as well. And of course, that unlocks a lot of new use cases and uh, can also leverage the general aviation airports as well, as well as perhaps additional heliports and vertical landing sites that people are looking for. It's a very exciting time. All right, let's go to the next slide. Who is Beta Technologies? Now, uh, this is a great photo. Uh, just gotta love that shot. You know, it has a nice dynamic uh, flight profile. We're doing uh, conventional flight testing. The lift kit is not on the aircraft at this time, but we're flying up here in Plattsburgh and in uh, Burlington, Vermont. So Plattsburgh, New York is across Lake Champlain, and we're able to use the old Air Force Base there as a uh, facility for testing our aircraft. And so we have a lot of fun things to tell you. So let's get on with Beta Technologies. Next slide. Yeah, um, I had a long career doing industrial, commercial, medical uh, research work, helping the General Electric Company advance its various technologies and various commercial platforms. But then uh, I had a phone call from my business partner, Kyle Clark, and he said, hey, Herm, let's do something crazy. And at that time, people were starting to ask about, is electrified flight possible? And that was four and a half years ago. And so that was the impetus and the spark that started Beta Technologies. We're up to 250 plus team members now at five different facilities. And we are focused on changing flight through electrification, trying to do elegant solutions, uh, trying to keep it simple, cost-effective, and minimal environmental impact. So that's our mission statement there. And here we are, the Chase helicopter, uh, it's an A-star. Uh, chasing our LEA aircraft during flight testing here over Lake Champlain. Next slide. So this is a, sort of a picture of our facilities up here. We have a, about a 30,000 square foot hangar, plus we have uh, four or five other buildings uh, dedicated to machining operations or welding or uh, manufacturing. So uh, this is a picture of our team. It's about eight months old. Uh, we're double the size now. All right, next slide. Yeah, uh, we were established by Kyle Clark. Uh, he's uh, not only is he an expert in the field of uh, power conversion and thermal dynamics, uh, he also is a pilot and he's also has a, uh, what do you call that? Investment banking interest in degree or certification. And he's collected quite a few uh, uh, experienced people that advise us. Uh, Martin Rothblatt, John Abley, who helps set up Boston Scientific and all of the pacemaker standards. And of course, Chuck Davis and Dean Kamen, Dean Kamen of uh, Segway fame. So we have a nice set of advisors that really help us to, to navigate this world of startup company and uh, investment from outside. Thanks, next slide. Yeah, this is a quick overview of our prototype EV tall aircraft that we're building uh, for a few customers. And I'm sure all of you are scanning the specs in the description. So just read them, soak them up, and enjoy them. Uh, we are trying to get to 250 nautical miles. That's the big swing. That's why we call it the Olea 250. And it's going to try to achieve that with a maximum cruise speed of 145. Uh, typical is 105 knots, which is what, around 120 miles per hour. 
stall speed for this aircraft is around 70 knots, 80 knots. Um, this one does show the configuration of the aircraft with the four lifting rotors. Uh, so there is a lift kit that we can add to the aircraft to make it vertical capable. Uh, it's relatively quiet when it's in cruise mode. It's, it's amazingly quiet. It's, 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 it's a glider with an electric pusher motor. It's just beautiful. But vertical takeoff, of course, with four rotors going, there is some more noise there. Okay, let's go to the next slide. We really are trying to satisfy sort of three main areas, uh, cargo logistics, government or military use, and passenger use. Um, the medical was actually the first use. Uh, the United Therapeutics wanted to transport medical goods to save patients at uh, hospitals, uh, but they also wanted to not just save the patient, they also wanted to save the planet. Because if you save the patient but kill the planet, what good is that, right? So they became a natural first promoter and customer for us. But then it went to the cargo folks. They are very interested, military folks, very interested. And now also we have passenger. So a great group of customers uh, really interested in, in this capability. Next slide. Yeah, so we're engaging the FAA very early. And uh, the Air Force will probably be the first to adopt and implement um, they have uh, different means of operating aircraft that they feel are safe enough through a military flight readiness review. After that, we would need to then sell to folks through a full certified aircraft, mostly Part 23. So the last would then be the blade or the uh, urban air mobility. We feel that uh, would probably be the third area of adoption. Here at Data Technologies, we're about revolutionizing flight through electrification. So the aircraft is quite novel and different. You've seen that. Uh, but it's also more than just the aircraft. You have to have the recharging solutions as well. Uh, so we started developing a fully featured uh, helicopter deck for a vertical landing and the infrastructure underneath the deck to support that flight crew and or the mission. It could be storage. It could be uh, pilot uh, sleep or um, rest quartering, uh, sort of a small FBO flight base of operations sort of uh, office, plus all the electrical infrastructure. And so we're starting to develop these uh, options for people, whether they can land on the tarmac or they need to land on an elevated deck or they need various uh, support features to, to support the mission of the aircraft. And so we hope to get to uh, a lot of charging infrastructure rollout in the next uh, eight to 12 months. So this is another significant part of our business is really uh, laying the groundwork for the future of electrified flight. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, purple is in process, green is completed. Um, this is a little bit out of date. We're actually further along than this. And we're sort of targeting the Northeast. Uh, we also have uh, plans for the West Coast. We have something installed in uh, Huntington Beach, uh, California now already. So we're starting to expand the West Coast as well. Uh, we hope to utilize this network later this year to fly from Vermont all the way down to uh, Bentonville, Arkansas and back. So it's kind of fun to be part of the rollout. It's a little different strategy than some firms. Some firms, you know, try to change the future by, you know, building significant vertiports and cities. And that's really a difficult problem because of all the zoning, the ownership, the acceptance. So we're taking a little different approach. We're just going to airports and facilities that are interested and in starting with them and putting actual equipment in the ground and providing real solutions that will be able to you know, recharge aircraft. So, so far, I think it's the largest uh, aviation oriented uh, electric recharge infrastructure in the world. Next slide. So it's not only the aircraft and recharging the aircraft, it's also about pilot training. Uh, we know that uh, autonomy of flight will probably not happen for the next several years. So we really have to develop our own flight training program. And we do that through simulators. And these have also been a nice sort of spin-off uh, of beta technologies that we're able to now 
design, uh, build, and install flight simulators in a matter of weeks uh, for various customers. Uh, we use these micro domes and mini domes, and then we also have the what we call the big dome, the thunder dome. And um, it's a very effective means of uh, giving uh, the pilot or the training pilot a uh, very convincing uh, flight simulation and training. We do uh, negotiate with the FAA. We require the pilot first to have single engine land, multi-engine complex, and then also have a rotorcraft rating so that the pilot comes into our program already knowing what a helicopter is, knowing what a fixed wing or multi-engine aircraft is. And then we combine those into our training program so that they can become approved for flying the uh, ALEA aircraft. So far, we have uh, six pilots uh, approved for flying ALEA. Let's move on. Yeah, so that leads us to our flight test program. Uh, we've been flying uh, the ALEA aircraft for about two years. Before that, we flew a earlier generation of aircraft, EV tall, for about one year. So we have three years under our belts now. And we've done a lot of test flights, uh, various vertical uh, hover characteristics, and now also conventional flight characteristics. Eventually, then we bring the two together. Once we understand how it hovers, once we understand how it flies regular, then we can start to bridge the gap with our transition in and transition out of vertical flight. Uh, we also use scale models, uh, not shown in this presentation, but uh, they were very useful to help us explore the behavior of the aircraft using one-fifth scale model flight as well. Okay, let's do the next slide. Certification will be a significant effort. Uh, we all understand this because these aircraft fall somewhere between part 23, part 27, right? Uh, we have to pay attention to all that. Uh, crash, crush, um, all of the uh, G loadings uh, under various modes of flight because you're bridging the two. You have to you know, sort of negotiate and see which regulations are best to follow or combine. So that continues to be a major effort for us. All right, next slide. And the next. If interested, um, I could go on and spend some time talking about energy storage. Uh, this seems to be the one technology that the public and a lot of engineers say, is it ready? Is it mature enough? And I'll try to just uh, show you a few slides on that topic because it is of key interest. It's really about safety and energy density, high specific energy, watt hours per kilogram. But we're also noticing that you have to pay attention to your watt hours per liter. Otherwise, you might have too voluminous a battery and it takes too much aerodynamic drag to put it through the air. And we are starting to, to see a nice balance between safety and energy density and a lot of the automotive cells. So we tend to leverage those. Because e aviation is such a small industry, we really have to leverage the advances of other industries like the automotive industry to use their cells. Next slide. The challenge in batteries is to make them safe enough. In particular, the multi-thermal, multi-cell thermal runaway tests and mitigating that. When a cell fails, it eventually will. How does it propagate? And if it does propagate, can you contain the uh, battery failure? Uh, sufficient amount of time so that the aircraft can get to the ground and the people can aggress. And so that becomes one of the most uh, challenging aspects of uh, good battery design. And of course, you have to deal with all the crashworthiness, uh, right, all the G-forces. So it's a very challenging problem. Next slide. This is a, a quick plot of what a power profile looks like in a typical EV tall aircraft. Uh, you see a fair amount of power at the beginning to take off and transition out, and obviously the climb and cruise phase, and then finally descent and landing. And landing is a little less intensive than takeoff and transition out. So this is your uh, typical profile that we have to now design to. And the landing profile is the most challenging. <laughs> That's when the battery may be more depleted that's when the battery is 
sort of running out of both voltage and series impedance. And so that's the one you really have to design for. That's the challenging aspect. Next slide. Yeah, and everyone likes to talk about specific energy density. And they say, oh, our cell is 500 watt hours per kilogram. That's great, good job. But is it safe enough? Uh, or how much of that energy can we use to do the final landing? Um, if it's not power dense enough, you, you might need to save 30 or 40% of the state of charge in reserve just so you can do the last landing. That's a high power pulse. So there's lots of restrictions and elements that erode the, uh, the raw cell specific energy density. So by the time you get to a full battery pack, the effective energy density might be quite low. And that's the real challenge. Next. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about um, cycle life because the battery is expensive and it's one of the main cost items if you look at the operating cost because the battery mainly lasts two or three years and then one has to replace it and that might be several hundred thousand dollars. So similar to like a turbine rebuild uh, after it TBOs. And so that becomes a significant cost uh, for the electric aircraft as well. But at least the fuel cost is quite low. Uh, the kilowatt hours of electricity are relatively cheap compared to Jet A. Okay, let's move on. And I'd just like to leave it there. That's a quick intro to Beta, a quick intro to the ALEA aircraft and the challenges in the energy storage area. I hope you liked it. Uh, I did share a video with Lauren if she feels that there's sufficient time. It's a four minute video that was recently released and posted on the evtall.org. Uh, website, but it highlights one of our sponsors, our first customers, who's also a pilot, and uh, she was able to then fly the aircraft for the first time after going through all the appropriate training. I think everyone has to hit uh, microphone. If you hit play or I hit play, would that work? I I'm going to try to hit play. Uh, if there are any issues with the audio, um, the link will also be posted in the chat box so you can, the audience members can, can view it themselves. So I'll try that. Is there any audio? Unfortunately not. Yep. Okay. We'll paste in the chat. Super, that's just a nice news item. It gives us a little insight into our flight ops and preparing for the flight, and then uh, having uh, one of our main sponsors and customers actually experiencing the flight. And so it's a, kind of a fun video that gives you a little more insight into uh, how we work and, uh, and how we share with uh, a key customer. So you can hit pause on that. Maybe we can go to the question uh, and answer period. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, type them into the question function on that sidebar on the right, and uh, and Scott uh, Scott Hanula will uh, consolidate the questions and, and ask them for you. Hey Herman, thanks thanks a lot for being with us today. Um, first question that's in actually the only one I have right now, so hopefully people have time to enter some more. Uh, but the first one's in is that compared to a clean configuration, what's the approximate drag increase from the uh, from the lift kit if it's inactive? Great. That's a good question. Um, it's all about lift over drag or L over D ratio. And the raw aircraft is humming somewhere around 17 uh, L over D, which is pretty attractive. Uh, without the lift kit, we should be able to get a little higher. So we're losing at least a point or two. A whole count and so we might be able to achieve 18 or 18 and a half L over D without the lift kit but with the lift kit it comes down to 17.2 or uh, we maybe as low as 16.8 so it is a 17 percent hit now we do pay attention and we try to get the lift rotors to park in the javelin position uh, into the wind and we also located the quadcopter such that the fore and aft lift rotors uh, sort of are in line with each other. And you may have also noticed that the tail, uh, the bronco tail, uh, not bronco tail, the longhorn tail, brings the vertical stabilizers out a little bit. And we try to get them out of the turbulence of the, um, 
uh, lift rotors to keep the aircraft clean so there's no turbulence back there so you can still fly very, very smoothly. So a lot of thought went into that. Uh, that's also why we decided on the quadcopter arrangement so that we could have a little bit more streamlined aerodynamic cruise flight. So try to make our aircraft as long range as possible. Great question. So I'll add my question to this one that came in as well because I think it, it connects is that um, you know the charging station approach is really interesting. Um, but the question is, how do you manage flexibility in terms of different destinations? Is it the idea to keep this purely electric? Is there going to be an option for a, 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 an APU style augmentation or something like that? Excellent. Tesla as a car company came to this decision point as well about six years ago where they thought, man, the batteries aren't good enough. We need more range. Let's hybridize. And the purists said, no, let's keep it electric. Let's be truly, totally electric. And here we are six to eight years later, and the proliferation of charging stations has paid off, and it's much easier now for Tesla owners to freely travel and use their automobiles uh, without too much consideration for where they're going to charge. We hope that to also happen in the aviation space as we roll out recharging infrastructure across the nation. Uh, of course, it's not at all 5,000 airports in America yet, but it's saying it's at the first you know seven and we're planning 16 more and you know by the end of the year we'll have you know 47 more and so uh, fleet operators would probably say hey it's not a problem we can operate our fleet between these you know 10 20 locations and it will be perfectly acceptable but for the general aviation enthusiast um, they might have to wait a little longer before they can freely travel to any airport in america but at least the charging infrastructure, the core, is still very, very similar to the automotive domain. And so, as the automotive domain puts chargers everywhere, it might be very easy then to slip that over and get that into all these airports as well. Did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, it certainly did. Um, oh, I didn't mention the hybrid. Um, I really, maybe I shouldn't, but there are practical issues when you have to uh, deliver your aircraft to people, uh, perhaps in Europe, uh, if they're manufactured here, how do you ferry an aircraft to Europe? Do you fly it? Do you ship it? Do you what? And so hybrid, there might be an argument there for, for hybridizing or having a hybrid kit for such an aircraft. For a delivery kit or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, Lauren, you said that maybe you could unmute for one of our guests to ask a question directly. Yes, uh, Dory Resnick has a hand raised. Dory, I think you can uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Or maybe I, it, hand if, if not, I think um, the next one is two up here, and it seems to be a, a couple more maybe around the idea of um, the batteries and um, you know what, what is the environmental impact and what's the recyclability of of the battery components? Oh, great question. Um, the aviation industry uh, has not yet established uh, the rules or regulations around when a battery should be retired. Is it based on you know TBOs or hours or is it cycles or is it what or general condition right? So as we establish those, they're probably going to be conservative. So there's probably going to be sufficient health and or performance left in the battery to support secondary functions. Uh, so that sounds like a great argument uh, from the top. But when you get down to the details, you realize which industry is going to use these second use batteries. Uh, so at Beta here, we in our recharging infrastructure for the airplanes, uh, we also integrate batteries on the stationary side so that we can power buffer to the grid and provide grid services. And so that, you know, theoretically works out great for about 10 to 20 percent of the installed uh, units across the nation. You know, it's not every location needs that fancy feature. So it's still a bit of a stretch. We're going to be producing quite a few used batteries as we build more and more aircraft. Um, so we, we really encourage the second use market, um, but we're also working with a very progressive firm in Sweden, a uh, major uh, cell developer that's also working on uh, the recycling process uh, because they're very much uh, environmentally focused. 
but it's it's not fully baked yet. So I can't give you a solid answer. Just know that uh, second use or used uh, lithium ion batteries will become a, a major concern after uh, you know if the aircraft is successful and permeates the market, you know, on the order of 100 to 1,000 or 10,000 units, you start to get a significant uh, used battery problem. It's good. Uh, good answer. You know, some unknown there, right? So, um, Again, the automotive industry will lead us in that direction. Yeah. But the automotive industry will also milk the batteries for all it's worth, right? When you have a used car, you keep driving it 20 miles, you know, or 30 miles, whatever it will allow you to. Right. right? Different uh, problem. Aircraft, right? Yeah, aircraft, you can't tolerate that because of reserve range requirements and safety. So got an interesting question here about uh, you. You know, at the beginning you mentioned that the Air Force uh, might be the first to adopt it, and they seem to be a, an early customer. Is their presence in this uh, as being an early adopter affecting some of your design philosophy? Actually, no. Uh, Agility Prime, uh, led by Dr. Roker um, and uh, Nate Dillard, they were actually the opposite. Instead of saying we're not going to kill you with requirements. We're actually going to encourage you and see what you can do. Uh, demonstrate your aircraft to us, or let's go through some approvals so that we, as the government uh, Air Force, we can actually pay for some of your flight test data. And um, so it's been a wonderful collaboration, you know, breath of fresh air, uh, where we can explore our commercial airframe. And the Air Force takes off the data and assesses it as is for their use and purposes. Um, and they also help us uh, coach us on the military flight readiness review and the reliability and the robustness of the design and the safety. So it's been a wonderful collaboration. We're really truly grateful to, to have a supportive uh, military contract essentially with the Air Force uh, through these SBIRs and through these uh, funding mechanisms at Chilean Prime. It's been a, a super program, really helping uh, American innovation, I think, in this EV tall area. That's good. So a little more technical question is, um, how, how is the planning gone around uh, establishing safe, tra safe transition in flight from like hover to forward flight or forward flight to hover? And is that an autonomous maneuver or a pilot spe you know, specifically trained to manage that? Yeah, we'll approach that at beta here through pilotage. Um, it's part of our culture. Uh, we are pilots on the pilot. Right. We all we provide training to our employees so that they can all experience flight and they can help uh, then design a better aircraft. So how do we approach transition testing? Uh, we do first hover testing, getting all of our control gains, getting all of our over torque and overdrive and inertia compensation because these big, you know, hover rotors are kind of inertia heavy. And so, you know, just getting all that tuned up. And then we took off the lift kit and we went over to uh, conventional cruise flight. We covered up the lift kit so that it was aerodynamically drag, you know, nice low drag. And we flew the airplane conventional. And we start to do all the stall sequences, you know, all of the stability and flutter uh, testing uh, and really explore the uh, sea tall capability of the aircraft all the way down to, you know, low speed stall flight. And then we combine the two. We put the lift kit on and the cruise kit and then we can start to fly the aircraft at altitude, for example, four and a half, five thousand feet, and start to get into slow flight. And we can transition to hover, hover literally at five thousand feet, and then proceed to transition out at five thousand feet. So if anything occurs, we can always get the aircraft and then get it back to the wing. We need about two thousand feet for it to drop and for it to cruise and get right back on the wing. Uh, we've done that through flight testing. We've done that through also through simulation. So that was, uh, it's good to know that you need a certain amount of margin to get your airplane on the wing and, and gliding in case, you know, anything happens in the, in the hover transition in or transition out. Uh, we are uh, students and, and members of the National uh, Test Flight Academy. So we were trained and we do follow all of those procedures and processes and one step at a time, you know, plan your flight and fly your plan. So uh, we take that pretty seriously here. Yeah. Did that answer the question? Yep, I think it did. And then uh, maybe 
uh, one more question here or two, Harry. I'm not sure how many you want to go with. Um, there's one here about uh, when do you hope to um, certify the aircraft through the FAA certification process? As soon as possible. <laughs> um, we, we are committed to the process. We are very respectful of, um, of why the process is there. Um, and, but we've also designed and chosen our aircraft to be as simple and elegant as possible. Um, we don't do tilty rotors or flippy wings, or we don't reconfigure the aircraft during flight. And we, we did that on our first aircraft, AVA, and that proved to be a very significant challenge. So that's why we went with simplicity, elegance, and straightforwardness. And uh, that tends to play well when trying to, to address all of these necessary uh, regulations and certification steps. So as soon as possible would be, you know, uh, within a few years. I'm not going to put a number on it because that's the wrong attitude. The right attitude is we will do everything necessary to make a safe aircraft as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> And, and along those lines on certification, what, there's another question here about um, bird strike tolerance and how, what the approach is. Oh, that's a great question. Um, because we were so serious about flying, and we do fly in uh, no icing conditions. We fly here in the Northeast. We're IFR all the time, almost. Uh, not today, but we take that really seriously. And that's why our customers came back to us and said, boy, beta, you got a real airplane design, you're really taking this seriously and you understand what 24 seven operations mean, uh, be it, uh, you know, icy conditions or high bar conditions or lightning strike and bird strike is part of that. Um, so uh, right now our experimental aircraft is fully carbon fiber, but we know right off the bat, we're gonna have to change that to a metal leading edge on the wings. Uh, bird strike and carbon fibers, not too good. You know, it's gonna be really expensive repair. So, you know, we're going to start changing our design, refining it for the certification, okay, so that we can uh, get all of those appropriate ratings. But the bird strike one was funny. You know? So you have your metal leading edges on the wings and your tail, things like that. That's great. But the, remember, the aircraft doesn't go 400 miles per hour. This particular one is maxes out around 150 miles per hour. And so the, the bird strike uh, risk is not as bad as you think. Um, Things like that. Interesting, huh? Yeah, very good. Hey, Harry, you got anything you yeah, want? Yeah, maybe one, one more question, Scott. All right. Yeah. Um, so let's see. You got one here. In, in the lift motors, does the electricity flow through the rotor bearings? Does that? Um, how, how does that manage to to the individual? Yeah, that's a no no. Uh, in the commercial industrial world, uh, people that were driving uh, electric machines uh, for pumping applications or downhole uh, had this issue where the electric drive was pushing high frequency harmonic currents in through the bearings. Uh, the return would come back through earth or whatever. And that was bad news because the bearings would get pitted and before you know it, it would fail. Uh, so you really have to avoid what's called the uh, High frequency coupling currents or the ground return currents. Um, so we do that through through filtering and through uh, actually low capacitive coupling to the rotor and to the stator. So it's a very careful management of all your inductances, your capacitances, and the speed of your switches. Now, these drives typically are silicon carbide. You need the efficiency, you need the high frequency uh, switching operation, but you have to slow down the switching edges, what's called your DVDT, your delta voltage, delta time. And we're getting up around you know, 8,000, 10,000 volts per microsecond. You have to slow that down a bit to get the edges off. If the edges come off, then those high frequency currents don't go through the bearings, and then you might be able to get you know, 10,000 hour bearings. Great detailed question. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, thank you to our audience. You didn't disappoint in the uh, quality of your questions. So that was that was terrific. And uh, and thank you, Herman, for just a fascinating uh, explanation of what's happening at Beta Technologies and 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 the design of the uh, electric uh, vehicle. So just uh, tremendously interesting. Uh, you're on the forefront of, of this emerging market, and it's very exciting to see and I really appreciate uh, getting a little debrief on uh, on inside uh, happenings on beta. So 
thanks again and uh, great to see you again. You know, uh, Herman and I worked uh, on a project way back in the early 2000s when he was at the Global Research Center and uh, and I, I remember that well and I can I can assure you he's an expert. So uh, thank you Herman for your time and thanks everybody for the questions. Uh, this is Harry Nahadis on behalf of the East New England chapter of the Vertical Flight Society. We're gonna take the next couple months off uh, from webinars and dinner meetings and start it up again in September. So please look for the notification coming out in September. We've got uh, quite an interesting lineup uh, coming up uh, in the fall. So uh, thanks again for tuning in and thank you, Herman, for an interesting presentation. Bye-bye, everyone. Oh, my pleasure.